but I wanted to just give a, an overview there. We've got 70 million for cycle uh, safety initiatives, uh, 30 million for pedestrian safety initiatives. There will be some overlap, which is great. But from a holistic transport planning perspective, um, I just wanted to give a bit of a background about you know, how you think about spending that sum of money. And, and 70 million sounds good, big amount of money, big investment in cycle safety, but when you spread it, spread it across the state and you try and spend it on infrastructure, it's actually not that much. So we really need to be really careful about how, about how we spend it. So I tried to, um, I've tried to put a slide together that encapsulates uh, cycling planning in Victoria when we consider we've got all those terms that get thrown out there, PBN, principal bike network, municipal bike network, smart roads, bicycle priority routes, strategic cycling corridors, and we chuck a new one in there, popular cycling corridors, just to keep everybody on their toes. So there's a fair bit in there. Um, and if, if we concentrate on the principal bike network and strategic cycling corridors, which some of you may be uh, quite familiar with, uh, they're really the important ones associated with this program. I like to think of the PBN, the Principal Bike Network, as sort of the arterial road equivalent uh, for cycling, and the strategic cycling corridors as the freeways for cycling. They're the, they're the ones where we want to get as many cyclists as we can through. So to generate these, I mean the PBN first, the Principal Bike Network was first developed in 1990. I think, if anybody, but I don't, we didn't hit the mark on that one because um, it was just on arterial roads. Um, so that combined with the municipal bike network worked together and got the revamped principal bike network in uh, 2012, which is a much better, uh, a much better system there. And then there was a lot of work done uh, with many of the people in the room, many of the councils to come up with these strategic cycling corridors. Uh, and there's a whole lot of things that fed into that. So we saw the national cycling strategy, the state cycling strategy, all feeding information into what should be the principal bike network and the strategic cycling corridors, the great strategic directions, the smart roads, road use hierarchy, which some of you are very familiar with, uh, the sort of Plan Melbourne, IMAP, uh, all feeding in there. The local government uh, strategic objectives uh, have been put into that and so you, then you build your strategic cycling corridor and principal bike network. And that starts to align as to where you're going to invest. Uh, and then that can be used really in the planning sense for any new developments and encouraging them uh, if they're on these networks to or mandating that they invest in cycling infrastructure. But it also then comes out to looking at high crash areas on these routes or close to these routes um, that we can then invest in bicycle projects to uh, make these strategic cycling corridors where we're trying to encourage all the cyclists to use this. We need to make this as safe as we can. So that's the sort of the simplified version that I've tried to, uh, tried to put up there. Uh, and, and then for those main cycling planning corridors, the principal bike network, a subset of that is the bicycle priority routes, which is the smart roads routes. Uh, then strategic cycling corridors sits in there. And then we've got this new little one, which is where the investment for this 70 million uh, for cycler safety, and it's the popular cycling route, so it sits in there. So you can see it's been very much targeted. Uh, and I'll let Carly explain a little bit more about once you've found your popular cycling corridors, where you actually spend the money and how you spend the money and you know, what you actually build. Uh, in terms of, it, we've had some really good discussion about crash statistics, crash data, where it comes from and, and what we do with it and how reliable is it. So for this program, there's a lot of time spent on uh, getting as reliable data as we could. Uh, so we didn't actually, so we looked at the VicRoads uh, crash data, which is the police reported crash data, but then it was actually all validated against the TAC claims to ensure that um, with any TAC claims that didn't have a police report for some reason, we were capturing those, and vice versa, if there was a police report done and it didn't actually eventuate in the TAC paying out, so there was an injury, it didn't, it didn't get included. 
And that's a really important step for the TAC to take because they, uh, they're the ones paying out that money. It's an investment decision to reduce trauma. So they need to be sure that it's actual uh, trauma reduction that they're going to get uh, in terms of payouts on, on this. So uh, collected data, there's, there's the actual TAC validated data, which it's not that far out from the uh, VicRoach Crass stats. Love to get the hospital data and cross-reference this. That's a, but you'll see there are about 3% of fatalities uh, are cyclists, but much higher when it's serious injuries. Um, up around the 7% uh, and 8% of the other injuries. Uh, and then worked with Vicro Spatial Services to map this. And um, unfortunately, uh, stories like Adrian's are very common out there. And you can see black dots there are these, these sorts, of, sorts of stories that have, the TAC has paid out, paid out money to these people. So there are levels of injury that they need that rehabilitation. Uh, so looking, and that's just the Metro Melbourne. We've done strategic cycling corridors and validation at the outer metropolitan regions and in regional Victoria now. So we're, we're out there identifying strategic cycling corridors and areas for investment across the whole state. So uh, it's really looking at these areas and, and bits within the strategic cycling corridors, looking at these hot spots, understanding, using some really uh, sophisticated algorithms out of uh, the Thick Road Spatial Services and, um, have developed to understand where the highest risks are and where you could uh, and whether they lie on or near a strategic cycling corridor and you can then do that investment. Uh, so some really good data coming out backing up this program because you know every dollar we spend in cycling infrastructure we, we've got to be confident we're going to get a good return on that. That's really important. Um, so I'll hand over, I suppose, to Carly to talk to you about now with strategic cycling corridors that are all set, how we choose which infrastructure we're going to uh, build. No worries. So um, as Ken mentioned, we've got a $70 million um, funding package um, from TAC, uh, but within that package we also have ATV, which is Active Transport Victoria, who are involved um, within the program and the outcomes for that. So we've got obviously a lot along the state, we've got about over 200 strategic cycling corridors um, and with $70 million, whilst it sounds like a lot of money, it's not going to treat everything. So one of the things that we wanted to do was we wanted to find a prioritisation or a ranking for the different corridors. Um, so we got a Jacobs um, consultancy, they created a prioritisation tool for us um, and that ranking took into account not just crashes, took into account volumes of cyclists, likely future volumes of cyclists, what the current infrastructure is, what could you potentially do to upgrade the, the sites, um, and as well as the dollars, and that created a ranking for us. Um, and from that we've got a top 20 metro sites and a top 15 rural sites that we're looking at treating first off, but we're not just limiting it to those projects. So if there are projects that fall a bit lower but have really good demonstrated risks in terms of reducing the risks of fatal and serious injuries, then um, we'll consider those as well. So this tool, yeah, you can see some of the, the roads on that. Um, the tool is also really good at breaking up the, the corridor into sections. So as you can see, this is an example, there's different sections and then it can break the sections as well. So it can give us some really good data for our regions. The regions and councils were also involved in the ranking tool, so they're quite happy with the results. In terms of the overall investment, so we mentioned earlier there's $100 million. There's also um, some pedestrian projects out of that, $25 million has been put aside for pedestrian projects. Um, but there is a lot of interaction, so we're not just going to look at a project and go, oh, this is a cycle route, what can we do for cyclists? We're also going to go, well, how else can we treat pedestrians if they're in the area? Um, and other black spot issues as well, um, as well as the pedestrian programs, if there are elements of cycle safety, that will be considered as well. So it's not just going to be in silos of this is pedestrians, this is cyclists. And so as an example of that is St Kilda Road Project, is one of the the corridors that we're looking at and there's a big push not just for cycle safety but for pedestrian safety because the two go hand in hand in that area. As
Ken and I think a few people others mentioned earlier, our crashes go across arterial roads, local roads, they are in Metro Melbourne, in rural Melbourne, so we're not just focused on metro arterial roads, um, that sort of thing. So as you can see, there's 47% of people um, are killed or seriously injured on local roads, so there's a really high percentage. So having said that, Vic Roads as our regions will coordinate the, the projects, but they will work with local councils just because the, right, the routes do go across multiple councils. And one thing I should mention, this, this project is I suppose it's about doing a whole corridor. We don't want to just come in and go, oh, here's a tidal link, we'll fix this, and then people aren't going to ride either side. So it's really about trying to also fix the missing links so that it's safe to go from start to finish. Because it is TAC funding, when we are assessing the projects, we will be really assessing their cost per series casualty saved. So that's a, a big focus, but there is also the mobility focus, and that's where we're working with ATV as well to get both combined together. We're also looking at incorporating a lot of evaluation into the program. So we'll do a lot of before studies as well as after studies, and the regions are really on board with that. So that hopefully going forward, if we see that there are some really good benefits, um, we can keep rolling them out in future programs. In terms of actual treatments and what crash reduction factors, there's not been a lot of data in terms of how effective the different treatments are. There is some from the national guidelines, is that right? Yep. Which you give different crash reduction factors. So obviously your best bet is separating bikes off the road or physical separation, then you've got speed reductions, traffic calming, that sort of thing. So there is quite a range of treatments. We're not looking at just also doing one in silo. If we can do multiple treatments, um, we'll do it. And it does come down to obviously what we can do at set locations. Chapel Street's a bit harder to deal with than, than other locations. Some of the rural areas are a bit easier to have separated path, but sometimes it's not. Um, some of the stuff we are looking at is if there is you know, a lot of crashes along one route, can we do a really nearby path so people don't have to go outside of their way? get the cyclists on that safer path. Um, uh, so that's one of the things we're looking at. We are also looking into innovative options and new standards and guidelines in terms of the treatments for cyclists. So there's just a few sort of examples that will feature in there. There really is the need for us to have some innovation, I think, in the bike space. Um, so we are looking at other countries and what they've got. We've had couple of experts flown over from um, US and I think somewhere in Europe to come look at the St Kilda Road project which we're currently developing and provide suggestions um, and they're also going to come over as we get through the development of the projects um, to see what we can do on some of our tricky spots. Um, so we might see some new innovative innovation and obviously we'll, we'll do the before and after evaluations to see how effective they are to roll them out um, more lately. We're not just looking at mid-block um, you know, bike paths, we're also looking at intersection crashes. They're very common, especially in our metro areas, um, so we do want to focus some of our investment on those connections as well. Um, yeah, it's sort of a work thing, I was just going to say. We're, we're really at the beginning of the, the program. Um, we do have some projects that are more further developed, but we're really hoping that we'll be able to make a good change. Yeah, it's a tricky one. Um, obviously, you do have issues if you're putting cyclists with pedestrians and how they then interact with the community. Um, we're really not dictating a set answer for these projects. Um, we're working with the regions really interactively and they're working with councils very interactively to hopefully try and come up with the best solution for that corridor. Um, I know even in Metro South East we are discussing uh, beach road, we have the shared user path and, and no one uses it, so we're, we're trying to see if potentially there's ways to alter the land use of the traffic lanes through there to have maybe a shared user path and then an on-road for commuters, that sort of stuff. So we are trying to be more broad-minded than just going, okay, we'll chuck all the pedestrians on the shared user path knowing that they might not use it. So we really are looking at each of the projects individually. Um, there's no perfect answer, I don't think, which is part of this 
program um, and there's also not a lot of perfect treatments uh, which is why we're trying to look into the innovative space uh, looking maybe into the more Copenhagen style that we had um, with the car bikes going behind parked cars to avoid the dooring type accidents so we're, we're at the beginning and we are it's a very good point very valid point um, but yeah we are trying to take that into consideration We are going to look along the routes, what we can do at those intersections to help make this up. What I'm presenting this program is really about going back and I suppose retrospectively and reactively treating the corridors. There is a bit of a proactive approach in terms of we're looking at the whole corridor. Across big roads in other sections and even in our team there are other stuff that's happening in the cycling space um, in terms of improving the standards. Um, we've got a new team that's a safe system design team uh, which is looking at the, the safety and design for all, all users um, and their next task they're tackling is they're going to be looking into the cycling um, and what that means. Yeah I was just going to say those those are snips from a guide that's been developed in the Vicred standards area mm -hmm. uh, to inform regional engineers and councils if they if they want uh, as to some of the options out there and they are taken from European and American uh, best practice in how to treat the intersection for cyclists and it does roundabouts uh, and it does uh, uh, signalised intersections, unsignalised intersections and the options that are available.